Okay, so um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, numerical cognition in lemurs. And um, some of you know that uh, I'm now at uh, Penn, at the University of Pennsylvania, but I was here for a long time, left recently. Um, and one of the highlights of my 15 years here at Duke was working at the Lemur Center. And I want to acknowledge people before I even get started. Um, and specifically, all, uh, Bill Highlander actually really got me uh, off the ground doing work at the Lemur Center and uh, gave me the financial resources to build the apparatus that you're going to see um, and uh, got me interested in working with lemurs here and, uh, and continued to be just as supportive. And um, the staff has just been wonderful at the Lemur Center. And we worked with lots of undergraduates and graduate students. And your next speaker, uh, Evan McLean, also did a lot of the work that uh, we worked on at the Lemur Center. OK. So we worked on lots of different things like ordinal memory, so memory for lists in lemurs, um, risk and decision making in lemurs, and transitive inference reasoning in lemurs. Um, but I'm going to focus today on numerical cognition in lemurs. And if you think about uh, what's unique about humans, there are lots of different things that are unique. But one of the things that's really important about uh, human cognition is our ability to represent number. And only humans are capable of using number to do things like build bridges or airplanes to fly around the world, use monetary systems, or do complex kind of uh, calculations that these children are doing with symbols, with symbols for number. But what my research program focuses on is the underlying representations for number that actually are uh, more conservative evolutionarily and developmentally. So the kind of primitive representations that underlie these symbolic representations of number. So why is number an interesting thing to study in animals and in, and in humans? Well, if you think about uh, what it means to talk about Fourness, for example, it's it's a very abstract concept. It's not tied to the uh, physical attributes of a stimulus, right? You can't talk about four in the abstract, really. Uh, or um, so we've got four golf balls here, four teddy bears, four food items, four musical notes, and they're all great examples of fourness, despite sharing nothing in common physically. So are animals capable of that kind of really abstract representation? Um, that's something that we have been focusing on a lot. So let me show you what I mean by that, that non-symbolic representation of number. I'm going to ask you all to participate in a little experiment here. I want you to raise your left hand when you see the quantities as soon as you can. <laughs> Not yet. Um, if, uh, if the quantity on the left is greater, raise your left hand. If the quantity on the right is greater, raise your right hand. OK? Are you ready? On your mark, get set, go. OK, pretty good. Ready? On your mark, get set, go. OK, and the last time? OK. <laughs> OK, so by your vocal response, it's clear that the last one was a lot more challenging than the first two. Um, so the quantities you actually saw were 1 versus 9, 1 versus 2, and 7 versus 8. And uh, even though the one dot in the first two arrays was larger, you had no trouble determining that the, nine, the set of nine was larger and the set of two was larger than the set of one. However, you had a lot more trouble with the seven versus eight dots. So this illustrates the distance and magnitude effect. So when the distance is great, you have no trouble. Um, when, uh, but when the distance is one, uh, the magnitude really matters here, right? So the larger sets are much more challenging for you. So this illustrates an aspect of quantitative cognition that is pervasive um, throughout the animal kingdom, and that is uh, Weber's law. Um, and it's true for discrimination of lots of different quantities, but it, uh, lots of different dimensions. But what's surprising here is that it's also true for number. So, it's true for weight, it's true for brightness, but it's also true for discrete entities like number here. OK, so in my research program, uh, we are guilty as charged of mostly using uh, the lab rat of comparative cognition, that is, the rhesus monkey. Um, and we've done lots of different studies with rhesus monkeys trying to really characterize uh, the numerical uh, representations. So we've shown that 
the kind of uh, discrimination that you all showed, Weber's Law, is true in rhesus monkeys. Um, and we've shown that rhesus monkeys can use uh, these nonverbal representations in all sorts of uh, arithmetic computations, addition, subtraction. They can match the number of things they hear to the number of things they see. Um, and I'll show you if you can start the videos, both videos. Um, so on your left, you see a monkey doing a touch screen task. And on the right, you see a baby doing a visual discrimination task. So the monkey there is responding to one, two, three, and four in that order, and then getting a pellet to chew on. You can see the size of the dots, uh, squares here varies, their arrangement varies, but this monkey uh, responds in that order one, then two, then three, then four, ignoring all the other aspects and just paying attention to numerosity. With the babies, we use visual habituation procedures and a, and a lot of other procedures as well and show uh, that they too can discriminate number um, and ignore variables like surface area or perimeter. And in fact, it they show uh, Weber's law as you did with your hands. So this is uh, data from monkeys, accuracy on the left and reaction time on the right, where you can see that it's the ratio between the two values that controls discrimination. And in fact, Duke students, and I'm sure Penn students as well, uh, perform just like monkeys in this task. And what we see is that it's the same brain region in parietal cortex uh, that supports number representation in primates, in rhesus monkeys, and in humans. And in fact, uh, when we use other methods to look at uh, the brain in, in infants and young children, it's the same region uh, in parietal cortex that's really important for representing numbers. So this suggests that it's a um, homologous uh, brain region and that it's a common actual uh, cognitive representation so we were really interested in seeing whether this is actually common to all primates um, and seeing whether lemurs uh, would perform similarly. And as Brian talked about, a real problem uh, in comparative cognition is the fact that uh, people often don't use the same experimental paradigms uh, to test multiple species. So that was something we were uh, trying to do with lemurs here. So in our first study, I'm going to tell you about a bunch of different studies where we're trying to ask different questions about numerical cognition and lemur, lemurs. And in the first study, we really just wanted to ask whether they could use number abstractly and ignore all those other variables, and whether they could learn a rule uh, for number. So the lemurs first, and this is ring-tailed lemurs in this first study, the lemurs were trained uh, with the values 1, 2, 3, and 4, and they had to choose the smaller and then the larger. And so uh, they saw the same stimulus set repeatedly on every day in a given session. And then when they reached some performance criterion, we showed them new stimuli. And when they finally had reached a performance criterion over many different sets, we gave them trial unique uh, tests to see whether they really knew to choose the smaller and then the larger value with these small values, one through four. So here I'll show you a lemur in this video. You can start the video. This is Aristides. Start the trial with that red square. sure what species that was. Anyone know? <laughs> okay. Um, so what we see here is that uh, the lemurs learn the task, so on the left here, um, and that they perform just fine with trial unique exemplars. So they have learned this rule to choose the smaller and then the larger value with the values one through four. But we wanted to see whether they would abstract this rule to larger values. So what would the lemur do when presented with five dots and nine dots now that they had been trained with the values one through four. So what do they do in this circumstance? 
And what we found is that performance depended uh, not on the familiarity of the numerical values, but again on ratio. And so what's important here is that, so familiar familiar would be a pair like one versus three. Familiar novel would be a pair where one, two, three, or four are contrasted with uh, five, six, seven, eight, or nine. And novel novel, of course, are the pairs within five to nine. So you can see that uh, familiarity is not what's controlling performance at all. And in fact, the monkeys did abstract the rule across these larger values. And there's actually no evidence that um, there's any different system being used for small and large values. And that's a little controversy in the numerical cognition research. Um, so we also wanted to be able to ask more quantitative questions. So do uh, lemurs differ um, in their Weber fraction, in the acuity with which they make these numerical discriminations? So um, are there differences between species? Uh, we might think that maybe the size of a social structure might uh, influence numerical cognition, or there might be any number of other possible things that might uh, cause species differences in numerical cognition. So um, in the next study, we were able to compare rhesus macaques and three different lemur species, um, mongoose lemurs, ring-tailed lemurs, blue-eyed blacks, and we used the exact same stimuli and experimental paradigm. They were all numerically naive individuals who had never uh, been in any tasks uh, like this uh, before and uh, asked how they might differ in their numerical abilities. So um, the specifics uh, were there, but not important. So we actually found no evidence of species differences at all in this task. So when given the exact same training, we found that there were more uh, differences between individuals than between species. You can see they're completely overlapping in these uh, four different species. And in fact, using Bayesian statistical modeling, we showed that uh, we could really almost prove the all. You know, that they're really, uh, we would need something like a sample size of 3,600 individuals to get any differences, and they weren't even predictable in terms of rhesus macaques wouldn't have been better than um, the lemurs. So in this domain, it really appears that uh, there's no difference between lemur cognition and rhesus macaque, uh, old world monkey cognition. And this just shows you the same, same data shown a different way. So we were also interested in whether lemurs use numbers spontaneously. So uh, because it's so conservative evolutionarily, of course, we think that number is a really important uh, dimension for animals um, in their lives. And so uh, we used two different tasks to ask this question. And one, one of the tasks, uh, lemurs watched food items being dropped into two different buckets and just were able to make a choice. And uh, here you can see that we used, uh, I believe it was 16 different species and had 113 different individuals in this uh, study. And each lemur was just tested for a single trial. And what we found is that, again, um, the lemurs did track the number of food items and choose the bucket that had the larger number of items. Um, and it was the ratio that was important. Uh, so they seem to be able to do a one to three ratio, but not a one to two ratio in general, um, although they, they could do uh, just barely the one versus two discrimination. So uh, they chose the larger and those dark bars um, more than the light bars um, for the one to three discrimination. So it appears that it's not the uh, size of the sets that's important, but instead the ratio. And there's, again, no evidence that they're using different cognitive systems for representing small and large values. In another experimental design, we dropped food items into a bucket and then retrieved some of the food items and measured the search time to see whether the lemurs expected more uh, food items to still remain in the bucket or uh, whether they um, knew that all the items had already been retrieved. And so it's a different experimental procedure, but the same basic idea. Uh, did their search time reflect the number of items that should still remain in the bucket? And this is just with mongoose lemurs, but again, found the same uh, pattern where the ratio was important. So in this domain, in the domain of numerical cognition, it appears that um, I assume that if we were to be able to do um, neurobiological studies with, with lemurs, that it would be the same brain region of parietal cortex that is um, keeping track of these numerical representations and that it's the same um, homologous cognitive representations. 
Okay, so I'm happy to take questions on the work that we've done. Thank you.